this is you law. It's about the things that interest me, and hopefully they'll interest you as well. About the law, past, present and future. Nothing more to it than that. On the 13th of August 1964, at exactly 8 o'clock in the morning, two men were executed. The crime was a common or garden crime if you can call murder that. A man was beaten and stabbed to death in his home. The two men responsible for it, Peter Anthony Allen and Gwyn Owen Evans, 21 and 24 years old, were petty criminals. It was that aspect, though, of petty criminality that ultimately linked and led to the death of this man. The interesting thing, though, about this crime and about this execution was that 50 years ago to the day it was the last execution to be held in Britain. John Allen West was 53 when he died. He lived in Seaton in Cumberland at 28 Kings Avenue. He drove a truck for a laundry firm and at six o'clock on an April evening he came home just as normal to start his evening. By 3 a.m. the following day, he was dead, beaten and stabbed by these two men. It didn't take long for them to be arrested either. Within two days, both of these men were arrested, separately and independently, and a very short investigation happened. The evidence was weighted against them. And in due course, 18 weeks after the death of Mr. West, these men were hanged. In fact, the physical act of execution uh, was an interesting area. In 1964, things had been refined. Before then, there was a longer form of hanging, where people would literally dangle for minutes, sometimes half an hour, and loved ones or friends would try to hasten their death during a public execution by pulling down on their legs. That's where the expression hangers-on came from. In 1964, though, uh, when Evans and Allen were awaiting their deaths, things were very much specialised. Hangman took a pride in their work. In fact, the neck was broken within a second, and sometimes quarter of a second. That didn't necessarily mean that death occurred straight away. In fact, death, according to the medics, occurred within about three and a half minutes. But because the neck was broken so quickly, uh, the victim was in a deep state of unconsciousness whilst three and a half minutes approximately elapsed and they suffocated to death. The rope was made of hemp and on the night before the execution it was stretched to make sure that it was absolutely calibrated to achieve the most efficient and quickest death possible. This is what weighted these men. 24-year-old Evans lived a similar life to his ultimate co-defendant, Mr. Allen. Evans, 24 when he was hanged, had a number of jobs. In fact, he tried to get positions in the armed forces, but had been discharged on a number of occasions. Finally, he moved to Preston in 1963, and as fate would have it, he lodged with Mr. Allen. It was to be a fateful decision. Peter Anthony Allen was a little younger. He was born in 1943. He'd lost jobs as well, and he also had enlisted as a junior gunner in the Junior Leaders Regiment of the Royal Artillery, but was discharged as well. He married in 1961 a cinema usherette, uh, and they carried on their lives, his a life of petty criminality. When Evans moved to Preston, he lodged with Peter Allen and his wife. As the car screeched away into the night, the neighbours at number 28, Kings Avenue, knew there was something wrong, something seriously wrong, and the police were called. Well, 
It was a manner from heaven for the investigative detectives. Because at the scene, they found a number of things. Firstly, they found a coat, a treasure trove of evidence. In the coat was a name label. Yes, it had Mr. Evans's name in it. In one pocket was a medallion. Got worse. Mr. Evans' name was on it. But that wasn't the end of it. In one of the inside pockets of the coat was an army memo form. Now, on this form was the name of a woman, a Miss O'Brien. And through pretty quick detective work, it was discovered that this lady had a very close association with your head, Mr. Evans. So there it was, as far as he was concerned. The coat, the name label, the medallion, the army memo document, and next to them, lying the dead and bleeding body of Mr. West. Things were looking bad for Mr. Evans. Mr. Evans and Mr. Allen had stolen a motor car to commit this offence. It was a black Ford Prefect from 1959. Now, this is the car that the neighbours heard screeching away from the crime scene, and it didn't take the police long to locate the car which had been abandoned, but link it to the two defendants. So they were taken to the police station, and at the start of it, Allen denied all knowledge of what had gone on. But then he was told that Evans was in custody. Alan's version changed. What he said was that Evans had set this whole thing up. They were both short of money and they needed money desperately. Into the house of Mr West they went. During the course of some argument, Alan now told the police, there was a fight. Evans gave Alan a metal bar and the rest the police put together. The death penalty was actually on the way out. In 1963, there had only been two executions, and in 1964, there had been none to date. And so these two men, Mr. Allen and Mr. Evans, sitting in their cells following conviction, genuinely and perhaps realistically thought they'd be reprieved. Debate was happening throughout the country, not just in Parliament, but in every pub, club and sitting room. The big issue was, how long would the death penalty last? Indeed, its days were numbered, but so were the days numbered for these two defendants. On the 20th of July 1964, Lord Parker, along with Mr Justice Widgery and Mr Justice Wynne, as they then were, considered the appeals of the defendants. After careful consideration, they came to their decision. Appeal refused. They were of the view that there was nothing that they'd seen which could interfere with the course of justice. But even then, with the campaigning and the pressure to abolish capital punishment reaching fever pitch, these two defendants, as they sat in their cells, felt that they wouldn't necessarily have to face the noose. But as time went on, their hope receded. It was really a roller coaster for them. A few months earlier, a brutal Lancastrian murderer had been reprieved. And so, yet again, thoughts were high about these two men living. But as the day came towards their executions, there were campaigns and protests throughout the country. But in reality, outside the prison, there were two small protests. The first, that they should be hanged. The second, that they shouldn't. Ultimately, time ran out. And the two men, one in Manchester and one in Liverpool, on the same day, at the same time, were hanged. You wonder what the minister responsible for reprieving these two men was thinking when he considered their cases. It was Alec Douglas Hume, an experienced man. 
this case was never about a miscarriage of justice. It was never about two people being wrongly convicted. They were quite properly convicted. But what this case was really about was whether these two men should die when everyone knew the death penalty was coming to an end. In August 1964, it was virtually a throw of the dice as to whether you were in the wrong prison or the wrong area or the wrong court complex as to whether you lived or whether you died. Some areas were simply not executing because they knew it was the end of the death penalty. Problem was, for these two men, was just like Mr West, the victim. They were in the wrong place at the wrong time. All rise.